Welcome to the BioBalance Helicast, episode number 355. How the government wastes money on medical research. BioBalance HealthCast features conversations about positive aging. Your hosts are Dr. Kathy Maupin, Medical Director of BioBalance Health and a leading expert in treating symptoms of aging, and Brett Newcomb, a licensed professional counselor. Dr. Maupin and Brett are the authors of The Secret Female Hormone, the seminal work about hormone replacement therapy for women, which is available on Amazon or from Dr. Maupin's office at BioBalance Health. Dr. Maupin's office is currently accepting new patients. Years ago, there was a senator from Delaware, before Joe Biden was a senator from Delaware, <laughs> named William Proxmire. And Senator Proxmire, once a year, would have a little celebration, call in the media, get his staff together, and he would issue what were called the Golden Fleece Awards. The Golden Fleece Award was an award that Proxmire gave to the federal agency that wasted the most money for the stupidest things. And he said, <laughs> we, we, as a country, ought to be watching for this, and we ought to be looking for this, and we ought to be stopping our government from wasting money on stupid projects, or projects that are no-brainers. That mm -hmm. Like, for instance... We found, uh, in preparing for this talk today, we found a government research project that was funded by the federal government to determine whether or not people who lost weight, because there were obese, Americans, been, Amer Americans, yeah, Americans who lost weight, uh, who had lost weight, regained the weight that they'd lost. If that was a, a typical process, and we need to do some scientific <laughs> research to determine what is the percentage of uh, weight that's lost that's regained, what percentage of the population that loses weight regains the weight. Or just do they gain regain it? Basically they, it was yeah. do the, Americans regain the weight they lose as, in general. As the supermarket tabloids will tell you, inquiring minds want to know. But we want to know, if you lose weight, are you gonna put it back on? Well And of course what we do know what we do know sense, is government research didn't pay for this bit of wisdom, is that uh, if your approach to weight loss is to go on a diet then yes, you will put that weight back on. Because mm -hmm. if you diet, the whole psychological agenda is to hit a marker point for a particular reason. Like, I need to lose 10 pounds so I can fit in my wedding dress. I'm getting married in July, uh, or in August, it's now July. What's the fastest way to lose 10 pounds? So I'm gonna go on this diet that I heard, if, if I just eat grapefruits for, for 14 days, will I lose 10 pounds? And so people do that. And mm -hmm. they market those diets. They're miracle diets. You read them in, in the There's tabloids. There's a ton of money wasted on grocery store. diets because yes. it's, a cons it's a consumable product. Yeah. Because people always lose the weight, and then they always gain they it, back it back and back more, on. and they lose the weight. Because unless you change your whole lifestyle, unless you decide you're going to always eat a certain way or always not eat donuts or always you know cut out some stupid food that you shouldn't eat right. anyway, then... You are going to keep it off. Food. If you only eat one food for 14 days, you're going to lose some weight. Yeah. And, and Depends so maybe on what you the food your is. goal and now you can get in your wedding dress <laughs> Not if and it's live donuts. happily ever after Not if it's until Krispy Kreme. you put your money back on. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So you're uh, going to you're gonna put your weight back on. So some clever so college somebody. professor <laughs> said, I wonder if I could get funding to keep my department going and keep my job by doing research to determine whether or not that's true. Well, what's scarier is the Journal of on? Endocrinology printed it, or yeah. they they actually put it in their journal. Like this well, is they got to fill it with interesting something. research. Selling. We have to sell. We, we're putting out a magazine of eighty two pages, four times a year. It's like we need four hundred pages, and it has tons of research in it. So yeah. they didn't need this article. Ah. If this was just. But what's more shocking is that the government, waste. somebody in the government said, well, I'll pay for that. And I bet it was really expensive. And I, I'm, and I, this isn't an isolated incident. When I read, I read like five different, six different journals a month. So when I'm reading these, I always, I mean, I should have pulled out, you know, well, ripped out all the stupid research they do. Like, um, if you run marathons, do, are you likely to damage your knees? Yeah, that's obvious. Why run. do... Why do we have to? Right. Why? I mean, why do we have to do a research project well, on that? Let's do something. The more something costs, the more we think it has value. So. So it's a one-to-one -one correlation. So. If you, if you find a cheaper way to do it, very often people will discount it and not buy it because it didn't cost as much. True, but what does that have to do with? Well, they've done a government research. Oh, so they wasted money 
our money, our tax dollars on government research. That's not, I don't, I think they should spend money on research. I think they should spend money on, on proving to the FDA that testosterone pellets in women work or the testosterone at all in women work. But there's lots of other things they could do right. that they choose not to do. So they do things that are man- vanilla, mm-hmm. that don't raise anybody's eyebrows and don't get anybody upset. And they just spend the grant money or the, or the research money. And this was the scientific statement journal where it first came out. And then it was reprinted in the Journal of Endocrinology. Right. So this is this is something where they, sh- you know, the whoever grants the grants, right, should be getting the Golden Fleece Award. I mean, there's a lot of this. You, if you're not a doctor, you wouldn't know that. But you just the Journal of OBGYN always has these ridiculous things. Like if the baby's smaller, is the labor faster? Well, huh, duh. That's kind of a physics question. Yes, of course, the baby's smaller, the, the labor's faster because the it's a smaller package going through the pelvis. Mm-hmm. Of course, it's not, it's not going to take as long. Things like that. We don't need to know that as OBGYNs. We don't need proof for that. We see it every day. Right. So that kind of so thing. common sense. Yeah. Common sense is, is something that is always money's kind of wasted on in terms of research. Well, common, common sense common is sense common sense. Common sense is an oxymoron. Because it's not common. <laughs> That's true. Yeah. That's true. But now that we're talking about the fact that people so we're going to offer regain this today regain in the hopes that the government someone the, the government, government might hear us will hear what we have to say and send us a huge check because we, we come <laughs> up with yeah these uh, don't these hold your breath concepts for if you lose weight how to keep it off or things that that will you prevent can do. you from becoming obese yes and so. Because we are concerned about the level of obesity, especially in aging populations, and the impact that that has on our health and on the cost to the country for the delivery of medical services to aged, obese people. But now we have children who are obese. Well, we do. That's and, a real concern. And we have, I, my belief is we have to start young. And one of the things that the Kennedy administration started was the yes. was the uh, president's physical fitness award, which was taken out of, I mean, somebody thought was offended by it. So the the phys- physical fitness award w- did several things. It brought to light the fact that people need to exercise, and we did calisthenics, and we also tried to get this award, even if we weren't naturally uh, in sports or anything like that then. We actually, I remember this being being pushed, throwing a softball with my dad to try to get the, the overhand softball throw. You had to throw it a certain distance, which I'm terrible at, but I did it and I kept trying. Right. So that made my parents very aware of exercise, which they always were anyway. And then I was aware of exercise and continued to exercise throughout my life. Yes. And so, that makes it valuable. So President Kennedy, when he was president, was concerned about the obesity level and the lack of movement and activity level among Mm school-age children. And part of what his administration wanted to do uh, was to find a way to encourage children and their families, but also schools and the educational system, Mm -hmm. to focus on the importance of physical movement, physical Mm -hmm. activity in children, Mm -hmm. and not just have them sit at a desk all day and study Mm -hmm. or learn, you know, paper-based things. So he had his brother, Robert Kennedy, who was attorney general, Mm-hmm. complete a, uh, a Marine Corps uh, physical fitness test that uh, people coming out of boot camp should be able to satisfy. And Robert Kennedy did that. And I, and I don't remember the specifics. I think it was like cover a distance of 50 miles within 24 hours. And so he had to run we didn't so make many the yards, kids do that. walk so many <laughs> They didn't make the children No, do but that. he wanted to make the point that even grown-up men, lawyers out of law mm-hmm. school, should stay active and be mm-hmm. active. And then as a nation, we need to be doing these things. And that's when jogging, and then, jogging came up. <laughs> so, so they took that example mm-hmm. and they created this program called the President's Physical Fitness Award. Mm-hmm. And they work with educators in schools around the country mm-hmm. so that in every public school in the nation, they had uh, a President's Physical Fitness Contest every year for every grade mm-hmm. and kids were given certificates mm-hmm. uh, that, I still have that were mine. signed by somebody in the federal government, you know, under the auspices of president. Who Kennedy. now has carpal but tunnel. They, they, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, but they, they send these certificates to the school and then the local coach principal, whoever, mm-hmm. uh, who was the, uh, 
authority in the school for, mm -hmm. for conducting this, that they'd have physical fitness de contest days mm -hmm. where you take a couple of days out of class and you'd have kids do all these different activities. I did that. Didn't you that do they that? Would, yes. Yeah. Yeah. That they'd mark. And then if you completed them, you'd get the certificate. And if mm -hmm. you didn't complete them, you wouldn't get the certificate. Right. Which is one of the reasons why it <laughs> died out. Because... After President Kennedy was assassinated, President Johnson came in. I mean, they, they continued this for they years. They continued it. Several different presidents. Until both, Nixon, I think. Both persuasions uh, supported this program. But then the American psychology moved in a different direction. Then we began to be concerned about a kid's self-esteem. And we started to give awards for every child. Every child gets a ribbon. But every child gets a trophy. that doesn't help self-esteem. Well, it hurts self-esteem, yeah. and but it took us a while to figure that out. It did, did and, and we didn't conduct big government studies to figure it out. We actually saw the impact in our homes, our families, and our schools, mm -hmm. where kids who who uh, got rewarded for doing nothing other than signing up or participating, mm -hmm. but not having a marker for for grades or for performance. Or you know, I can do ten push-ups, you can do five, mm -hmm. and, and I have to do fifteen to get the gold ribbon. Mm -hmm. So neither of us gets a gold ribbon. We just we don't get one for that because we didn't do the push-ups. Right. And so you know there there are life lessons about performance and participation mm -hmm. that are. In real reality life, based you have to do the work or you don't have get practical the prize. consequences. Mm -hmm. But we got away from that as a society. And so then we quit giving the president's physical fitness reward as a national mm -hmm. program. There are still some schools out there that do it, mm -hmm. uh, but it's not reflected in the system. The well, this leads into the, um, the idea that I think that. Right. We should get the, the gym or sports programs back into the schools. They've taken them out, saying that that, has, that helps have more time for academics, yet you think better if you have exercise that day. Right. So the gym programs or some kind of physical exercise should be back in the schools in a way that it fits the school. Like my daughter's school, they didn't have gym during the day, but everyone had to participate in the sport at right. all times. So if the kids didn't want to play a team sport or they didn't make the team, then they went to work out with a trainer. They had a big, they had a big gym with lots of machinery. And you know, there's so many ways to approach that sort of thing. For instance, in West Point, they have a, a protocol. Every cadet recites every day in every class. Mm -hmm. So you can't hide. You can't slack. Mm -hmm. And they do a lot of memory work, mm -hmm. which schools have gone away mm -hmm. from. You know, we used to have to learn to recite long passages from Macbeth or to memorize the Declaration. My of husband still remembers. Stuff. John still I, remembers I still remember. all of those when in the poems of events, and all of yes. for one people to divorce themselves <laughs> from the political bonds. I mean, I learned that in the fifth grade, and mm -hmm. I can do the whole two paragraphs. And I hated doing that because I always improvised. <laughs> well, that's a, that's a different skill. But at any rate. We have a set of 10 proposals that we would like to suggest for people to consider in their own lives and for schools or the government or anybody else that wants to pay attention to this, pay attention to it. But one of the things that we would suggest is reinvigorate, reinstate the president's physical fitness program. Make it a, a nationwide activity for all public schools. And we would even encourage private schools to do it, but you don't have the same regulatory capacity. Mm -hmm. But make it a requirement for kids to physically move, to to be active and have markers of accomplishment that they need to achieve. And if they don't achieve them, not that they're punished, but they're not rewarded. But, but then, then, beyond then that, you, you can focus attention on those who can't do that. Require kids to, to do some kind of physical activity every day and, and playing a sport right. is one way of doing it. Gym is a, another way of doing it. So that's that's on our um, right. That's on our list. So so those are two things that have to do with the youth helping the, and bringing it, the information home. You know, in the 60s, that's how America got cleaned up from all the trash we had. In the 60s, everybody just threw trash out their car window, and there was trash everywhere. We saw that again when... Well, most people of a certain age remember the commercial that they made with Iron Ice Cody, the American mm -hmm. Indian chief, mm -hmm. who was an actual Indian chief, who was uh, paddling down the river in a canoe, mm -hmm. crying because there was trash and debris floating in the river. Right. And that was a, a public service announcement. And it led to all of these clean up the rivers and creek days. At well, they did that staff. at the same time as yeah. they as they brainwashed the children. I mean, you know, they 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 made us all aware that it was bad to throw trash out the window, and not put it in a trash can, not and and, right. and to be that was messy. All part of that messaging. They did all of that. It was a governmental 
thing, but they did it all and it was very positive. Instead of using negative governmental um, kind of motivation, they used a positive one. And that was through the kids. They felt like they were doing something good when they threw their trash in the trash can. Well, speaking and that of helped us. Governmental intervention. Mm -hmm. There's one that you suggest that would be good for the country, and that is to take dangerous and toxic toxic substances out of our food. So you mean ingredients that are added to food for one reason or another, right. like uh, methylated B vitamins? Right, not methylated, but not they methylated, put in regular not. B vitamins. Right. There's there's a couple things, so, so we, we broke this out. Yep. Um, B vitamins are added, you see, fortified with niacin, fortified with fortified. B vitamins. So yes. they, they put... Um, these vitamins into the foods, but there's, and they're straight, it sounds like a good idea. They're straight B vitamins, but, uh, about a third of the population can't use straight B vitamins and it causes them to have, um, homocysteine and in their blood and that increases plaque in their blood vessels. So if they're going to fortify cereals, they should be fortifying it with something everyone can take with it, which is methylated B vitamins, which a, doesn't cause a problem. It used to be a commercial that I remember seeing that Wonder Bread builds Fortified. strong bodies eight ways or 12, 12 ways. ways. Mm -hmm. And because it was fortified. Right. And fortified means you got your basic Wonder Bread, which they, this is white bread, so they bleached all of the nutrients out of it. <laughs> and it's just filler. Mm -hmm. uh, it's like eating cardboard. But to make it not be just like eating cardboard, then they added ingredients and called it fortified. Right. And, and your contention is the ingredients that they have added serviced some industry's interest, some right. market's interest. And they've continued it and on and on. on. My it. whole life, is so, they've had that. Right. And, and but that's some not of good that for some of us. Ultimately, if you eat too much of that stuff, it can do damage. And you can have a high percentage of your population be damaged by, by a fortified food. Right. Then... That's something that should be re-looked at and something put in its place. But there's another thing that they did in the um, 60s. Yeah, in the 60s. They uh, took iodine, which is a binder in, in um, breads and all baked goods, and they took it out. And that was supposed, supposed to also give us a, um, a supplement of iodine. Like they did in salt. They put so iodine take in salt. what's naturally in the food out and then replace it with a supplement that puts it back in? Yeah. Okay. So, but there's not, iodine's not naturally in bread, They but they put iodine in bread. And then in the 60s, they took it out and put in bromine. Well, iodine helps, iodine is an essential nutrient for your thyroid. Bro bromine is a toxic substance and bromine is... One of the reasons I think many people can't eat breads or bake goods unless they bake them themselves, because they don't put it in. But they took out something we need. We need iodine. Most people in the United States are, are low on iodine. And well, yeah, because you prescribe a supplement called iodine. Iodorol. To a lot of people who live in the Midwest, which is where you operate mm -hmm. primarily, uh, because they live in a, a, I, an iodine sink. Is that what yeah, you call Yeah, an iodine it? sink. It's called the goiter belt, because you get a big thi thyroid and damaged thyroid if you don't eat enough iodine, and there's none in our water or in our ground. So you have to take a supplement. Now, the supplement we use works, but they used to have it in bread. They, well, used, they used to have so it in... So we didn't have goiters so badly or so pervasively no, right. back when they put iodine in In our the bread, and, they, bread. and we use salt more. It's also in salt, in some salt. So they took it out. And then and they, then put, they in put in bromine. something dangerous. And bromine is toxic. And bra bromine is toxic. That so doesn't make sense. It doesn't make sense. And somebody needs to rethink this. But, mm -hmm. but it, I mean, I don't have It the, doesn't make sense, but it does make someone money. It does make someone money. You're right. Okay. So, um, bromine's oh, also money. used in pools for instead of chlorine. Well, chlorine's safer than bromine. So, I mean, that's just a public service announcement. So, chlorine's not great, but you should have a salt pool probably, if you're worried about health. How but, about fluoride? Fluoride. Fluoride. What fluoride does in our water is not good. It kicks out the iodine off the thyroid, and then your thyroid doesn't work. So, I mean, it it actually, if you have... So why do they add it to the water? It's it's to help your teeth. It builds stronger teeth. Okay. So it does something that's good. It'll but, help your teeth, but it'll give you goiters. Yeah, or it'll kill your thyroid. Yeah. It's not... That, so it's a trade-off. It, it's a trade-off, but yeah. so everybody should be able to know that to make the choice. So which lobby... Uh, the, the dental lobby, the, the, the 
I don't know. I mean, I don't know if it was the dental lobby or the people that make fluoride or that it was, you know. Somebody got to the regulators and decided said, that this was this a has good to thing. Be in water in our community. But unlike drugs, they didn't look at all the bad things that right. could happen, you right. know? So they don't, we, when we turn on the tap, we don't get a big list of the side effects. <laughs> yeah. So that's, I mean, that's city water. That's not, you know, well right. water, but, right. but still that's how we change our water from just water. We add stuff to it. Yeah. To try to help us. And sometimes it backfires. Okay. So um, the, the fourth thing is... Um, revise the food pyramid. Revise the food pyramid. And the food pyramid was revised to make a food plate. And the food pyramid... The Harvard I, plate instead of the food Harvard pyramid. Harvard plate yeah. instead of the food pyramid. So right. when we grew up, the food pyramid, the top was protein base or fats, protein, and then carbohydrates was huge at the bottom of the pyramid. When we, they revised the plate, they asked the Harvard scientists to, um, to evaluate what we should be eating. And of course, more fresh fruit and vegetables was in there and less grain than they had previously had by a lot and uh, more protein. So when they asked the Harvard doctors to do the study. They did the study, they gave them the results, and then they changed the results to make more grain and less of the fruit and vegetables and less of the protein because America makes grain. Right. So, so it was a uh, financial reason that America changed the food plate, which <laughs> should be a guide, a well, true guide to us. it was a financial reason that was skewed to a particular market whose uh, lobbyists had convinced Congress to except their argumentation for whatever mm -hmm. reasons and however they may have done that. Uh, but they got the government to say, all right, we need to put all these grains back in the food pyramid. Well, the FDA agreed. And the FDA business. then put their seal of approval on the right. food plate. And they still called it the Harvard food plate, which made a lot of the Harvard scientists unhappy. Okay. So uh, you've already talked about decreasing the use of cars, doing more walking, more public more activity, more, more safe public uh, transportation. And we safe. have, a, we have problems yes. here with, what some of our public transportation not being safe and having to put having to put guards or police people on right. there. So and another thing that you recommend is to restrict the amount of time that children spend in front of TV or on electronic media every day. Right. And, and as an educator, I would tell you that's a really smart move. But as a health person, it's an essential move, not just a smart move. Those right. kids need to be moving and active a certain amount of time every day. And if you let them sit in front of the TV, one of the things you get with younger kids, for instance, uh, that leads to problems is little kids watch a television show until there's a commercial and then they explode. They run around the room, they bounce off the walls, they scream and yell, they punch mm -hmm. each other, they do whatever. And then they come back and go comatose to watch another television show. And they watch these television shows like Sesame Street or something that are calculated to build the energy in them and build the movement in them. And it builds and they sit there and they watch it and their bodies start to quiver with energy. And then they go to commercial and there's an opportunity to explode. And it also reduces their attention span down mm -hmm. to the, you know, the length of time between commercials. So we want to change short. that educationally, but also in terms of healthcare, we want to make our kids healthy. So restrict how much time your kids are using media every day. Well, I mean, you can restrict it by having them do chores. You yeah. can restrict yeah, it by I, I, requiring them to... They don't have to be doing push-ups. No, they, I mean, they can go work on the garden with you or plant flowers. They can, I mean, it can be a group thing that you ask your child to do with you, which right. should be something, if you start it at a young age, Family it becomes a habit. Right. So it is less time indoors staring and more time moving their body because most chores require that. Yeah. So, so that's... That's one of my ideas. <laughs> okay. Then we, then you can, uh, we, we well, give tax credits to cultivate. Well, like in World War II, for instance, uh, to encourage, uh, to, to, to create an economy that would support the war effort. They wanted people buying less uh, food at the grocery store. So they encouraged people to victory grow victory gardens. gardens. So we need to bring Victory Gardens back. We want to give people uh, some kind of a credit, some kind of an inducement, some kind of a social reward, whatever it might be, to, to grow food in your own yard or your own property that you consume uh, is good for you physically. Mm -hmm. It's good for you in terms of especially 
uh, dark green leafy vegetables. Yeah. You know, if you can grow those and you can eat those, you and your family are going to be healthier. But you're not going to throw away so much food if you see how much time it takes for it to grow. Yeah. Because we grow, we have a lime tree, a lemon tree. I mean, to get one lemon off of a of a lemon tree, it takes the whole season. I when mean, I I'm not going to throw my I lime literally lemons. Had kids that did not know that hamburgers at McDonald's <laughs> came from slaughtering and processing cattle. How can that be? They, they don't make that connection. They never see the, they never see it happen. They never see the production process. I don't want to see it happen. <laughs> but they at least Neither need to know they. what it is. Exactly. So, so, so you know, some kind of positive motivation for people to grow their own food if they they can even do it in you can have gardens a garden in your apartment. But a positive your, reinforcer uh, to, yeah. to find some leverage that says, if you do this, there's there's more than just good health payoff for you. Right. I go outside and eat the tomatoes right. off our tomato plants. I mean, that's just So, and then fun. Uh, another two, three more that we want to get in real quickly. One is decrease insurance payments or insurance costs for those people who are at ideal weight. If you can maintain ideal weight, if you are not obese, if you don't hit that, that wall, then your insurance should be cheaper because your health care costs are going to be cheaper. They are. Of course, the, the flip side of that argument is we need those of you that are healthier to contribute your money for the insurance because we have to spend so much more on those that are not healthy. That's right. And they have cost shifting as part of what insurance right. payments are all about. But still, I mean, you should you should have some kind of benefit uh, cost uh, monetarily. Beyond, beyond just being healthy. Right, but yeah. monetarily that makes you motivate you because some people aren't motivated by anything else. And then you also suggest that the federal government should require and state government should require insurance companies to pay for preventative medicine. And that doesn't just mean a pap smear to see if you've got a disease. That means obesity care and treatment and taking care of people for prediabetes and and trying to hit diseases before they happen. Right. So preventing illness, not just finding illness, which is what they consider preventive care now. Right. So all of these are things that we suggest people ought to do or the government ought to do or whoever's going to do it. Uh, we don't have the power. We hope somebody out there does. To live more functional, healthy, active lives because those are critical to our, our survival and progress as a nation. Thanks for listening. Email your questions or comments to podcast at biobalancehealth.com. You can find the Biobalance HealthCast on iTunes and on YouTube. For more information about bioidentical hormone pellet therapy and other reverse aging solutions, visit biobalancehealth.com or call 314-993-0963. You can find Dr. Maupin on Twitter at Dr. Kathy Maupin and on Facebook at facebook.com slash biobalancehealth. Find Brett Newcomb at brettnewcomb.com.